charged with maintaining international peace and security. The United Nations Security Council considers the crisis in Ukraine and perceived provocation by Russia. But is the UN body united in name only, outdated and divided and in need of reform? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Mike Hanna. Welcome to the program. Diplomatic efforts are intensifying to try to resolve the crisis in the Ukraine. The United States and Europe are considering hard-hitting sanctions to force President Vladimir Putin to withdraw Russian troops from the Ukrainian region of Crimea. Then there's the United Nations, particularly the UN Security Council. In its own words, a body that takes the lead in determining the existence of a threat to peace or act of aggression and which can authorize the use of force to maintain or restore international peace and security. But as our diplomatic editor James Bayes reports from the United Nations in New York, there's little real chance of any decisive action, forceful or otherwise, rekindling the arguments among critics for reforms. In recent days, the Security Council has met here around this, the famous horseshoe table, to discuss the issue of Ukraine. There was a great deal of discussion in the first place whether they should even discuss Ukraine because it's not on the Security Council official agenda. But eventually, after the ambassador of Ukraine sent a letter to the Security Council, the Western nations managed to persuade Russia to have a meeting. Initially, Russia didn't even want to have an open meeting. All of the 15 ambassadors here know, though, that there's no chance of any action on Ukraine. And that's because Russia is one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. It has a veto on any action, which explains also why there's been very little action by the Security Council on the issue of Syria, where there's been a division around the Security Council table between the Western nations on one side, Russia and China on the other. That's why some are again bringing up the subject of Security Council reform. The difficulty there is again the veto, because those permanent members can stop any reform, those permanent members being Russia, the US, China, France and the UK. Well, let's introduce our guests for this inside story and their area of expertise. With me here is Remy Pierre, Assistant Professor at the Department of International Affairs at Qatar University and author of the book Shifting Priorities in Russia's Foreign and Security Policy. In New York, we have Khan Ross, founder and director of the Diplomatic Advisory Group, Independent Diplomat, and a former British diplomat working for the UN in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo. Also in New York is Rasan Shabane, an associate professor of Middle East and International Studies at Marymount Manhattan College in New York, and a specialist on the UN's role in state building. But before we get to the discussion, I just want to take a brief look at the history of the United Nations. It was created in 1945 in the wake of the Second World War. The mission back then to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. The Security Council in particular was formed to pursue diplomacy and maintain international peace and security. The Council has 15 members, 5 permanent members and 10 non-permanent elected by the UN's General Assembly for a two-year term. The five permanent members are the United States, the United Kingdom, China, France and Russia. And it's these members that have the power to veto Security Council resolutions, as Russia has done with Syria recently and would inevitably do with Ukraine. Well, with all of that as background, let's begin the discussion with Khan Ross um, in New York. Criticism of the Security Council appears inevitable every time that there is a debate. Is this criticism particularly of the veto justified, do you believe? Well, I think there's enormous frustration when there's a, a situation of, of conflict, of uh, breach of peace and security, and the Security Council fails to act because, you know, all 193 member states of the United Nations has accepted that the Security Council is the preeminent body dealing with security. At the same time, nobody expects the Security Council to act when the interests of a permanent five member 
are at stake, as they clearly are in this case. So there isn't really a lot of frustration here at the UN, more a resigned shrug that this is business as usual. I think, however, the, the Ukraine situation points up the, the problem at the Security Council, but the much more severe crisis of UN inaction is Syria, where you have a long, an ongoing war that's lasted nearly three years that has cost perhaps 150,000 lives. You don't even have an arms embargo agreed by the UN on the regime that's killing its own people. That is a disgrace. Well, Russ and Chavanet, your view on this, the whole issue of the veto, is there a need for reform to remove or attempt to remove that device? I believe indeed uh, there is a need for uh, a, a serious reforms at the United Nations. The problem is, can it be done? And the answer to this, it can, but it's not easy at all, because the five permanent members must agree to any reforms that will be taking place, if any reforms will be taking place. The problem of, of the Security Council at this stage is basically the culture that has been evolving for the last three decades, and that is any one of the five permanent members that feels that it is necessary for itself to use force will use force without going back to the United Nations, without going back to the Security Council, and will justify that based on its own interests, i.e. the United States going to Iraq and Afghanistan, Great Britain going to the Falkland Island, now Russia is going to once to Georgia and now to Ukraine. None of these members, or China going to Taiwan, none of these members would even bother to look or even have the permission of the Security Council at all. Why? Because they know that they can do it and because they know that the Security Council cannot prevent them. So the culture that has been emerging, the norm that has been emerging at the United Nations is it is a very authoritarian uh, regime. It is a very authoritarian organization that the five permanent members can hold it hostage to, it, to their own interests. And because they are paying some or most of the dues of the United Nations, I believe that they feel that they can, specifically the two European countries, France and Great Britain and the United States. What should be done about this? I believe, you know, uh, going back to the charter and implementing the charter letter by letter, article by article. The charter is crystally clear. It's very democratic. And the charter calls for accountability, transparency and responsibility. It seems to be that at this stage, no one, no one wants to be held accountable, responsible or transparent. Well, let's just stay with that issue of the veto giving carte blanche. There we heard the argument that a veto of the permanent member allows them to do what they want to do. What's your view, Remy Pierre? Well, the United Nations, as any uh, international organization, is a tool at the end of great power politics. I mean, that they've been put together by the great power after the Second World War. The question of the veto is a question that is frustrating for several observers and most of the actors here. Uh, however, the uh, United Nations without veto power is called the League of Nations before. That was not more effective either. So the question is, what is the, the, the power that we give to international organization? First of all, we should not discredit the United Nations just for the, what's happening in the Security Council. There's a lot of work being done in specialized agency. I just wanted to mention this on development issues, environmental issues. It's a, it's a gathering of expertise, specifically in the question of the, the, the Security Council. We know that when one great power's interest is on the table, there's a situation of blockage here, and there's calls from reforms. But it's extremely hard to reform it because the great powers are also the one that will have to abide or agree on, on those reforms. Well, Con Ross, we hear the issue there of, of national interest being served by that veto. But it's more than that. For example, in a 20-year period ending in 2011, there were 24 vetoes. 15 of those were by the U.S. on behalf of Israel. The U.S. Had been essentially conducting policy, global policy, by use of the veto. Your view? Well, yes and no. I mean, to an extent it does. I mean, the UN is an odd place where Israel-Palestine is discussed. Um, obviously, it set down the basic law that needs to be respected of withdrawal from the occupied territories. And the US, at Israel, Israel's behest, has basically refused for the UN to be involved. And whenever the UN Security Council has wished to pronounce on the matter in any way that's critical of Israel, the US has vetoed that. But it is rather an exceptional case. The, the subtext, or well, not really a subtext, but there is another story of the Security Council, which is that since the end of the Cold War, there has been a lot done at the Security Council in forging agreements, in arranging peacekeeping missions, in managing mediation, in an awful lot of conflict.
conflicts, particularly in Africa. And there's a strong argument that the UN's action in these places has actually helped mitigate conflict. So it's not a, it's not a picture of un, unbridled crisis. Uh, uh, Russell Chabonet, I think that's an important point that the UN Security Council has served uh, great value where everybody on the council agrees. This is the case. Would you agree? Uh, I mean, I would agree, but this is uh, this is part uh, uh, and parcel of the problem. Where everybody agrees, there seems to be low politics, not high politics for every party. Meaning that when they agree on developing or sending a human rights uh, commission or or assigning a peacekeeping commission or a peacekeeping force to a, a region or to an area, that's for them low politics. But when, when it comes to high politics, i.e. their core interests, when their core interests are there, none of those countries will be able to move an inch for the sake of a human rights, a humanity, or global development, or development for that matter. Thus, I believe that the Security Council, an institution that was formed and established after World War II, is a 20th century institution. And now we are in the 21st century. And the 21st century requires from us to think ahead and to really reform the United Nations and reform the Security Council to answer the hopes of the people for the 21st century. Israel, Palestine, Syria, Ukraine, Georgia, Northern Ireland, Kashmir, Cyprus, all of those uh, problems, all of those conflict areas require from us and demand from us that the Security Council be reformed because the Security Council has failed to answer any of the above. Well, and thus, I believe it is time for the Security Council to be, re to be reformed. Well, let's just go to Remy Pierre on that particular contention there, that uh, generally it is a, a succession of failures. All the examples that we heard there were the Security Council not being able to operate effectively because of blocked resolutions. Well, uh, I think you raised a very good point just a little bit earlier, the fact that it's not always Russia, for example, that brings a veto power. I mean, the U.S. has brought its veto power. France has threatened to bring its veto power in 2003 uh, over the conflict on Iraq. So it's, it's, it's not always the same player that actually uh, raises against a, a specific issue. The question is what conflict or what operation is legitimacy, is legitimate. Uh, the reason to be for the United Nations is to back up some international uh, uh, actions from the international community. Uh, on, on the, the list is indeed uh, quite impressive of, of moments that this ad could have been done better, that there was a blockade, that it was not possible to actually implement uh, you know, comprehensive and effective policies. Uh, but the question is, what else if we don't use the United Nations? Is the only authority today that has this international legitimacy? So I, I, I guess if you actually really try to look at what could be done, maybe reforming the veto power is indeed something that should be done. Maybe increasing the numbers of members at the Security Council. There's been some talk about maybe including additional members uh, from South America. Is, was it going to be Brazil? Is it going to be uh, uh, Mexico? Is there going to be members also from Africa? And then the question is, who do we put around the table? Uh, and there also there's a geopolitical conflict looking at those specific questions. Well, well, I'll get to that point of exactly what can be done. Yeah. But let's just take a step back here and take a look at the UN Security Council. Well, it's had a checkered track record, as we've discussed. The challenges were first exposed during the Cold War when the US and Soviet Union routinely, routinely used vetoing rights to oppose one another. A nuclear non-proliferation treaty was signed in 1970, but the Security Council has had little success reducing stockpiles or preventing nations from developing new weapons. It's also been accused of ignoring atrocities, such as the 1994 Rwandan genocide that killed up to a million people. Similar criticisms have been levelled over Syria, as we heard. Uh, proof, say critics, that it functions only as a talking shop. And in October last year, Saudi Arabia became the first member state to reject a seat on the Security Council, saying the UN was unfit for purpose and in need of reform. But Let's get back to that issue of what can be done with Khan Ross. We've heard, yes, there need to be changes. We've also heard it's going to be very difficult because those who need to make the changes are those who will resist them, who do have the veto. What do you think can realistically be done in terms of reforming and making the UN Security Council more transparent, more accountable and more democratic? 
I think the chances of fundamental reform of enlarging the membership or changing the veto are very low. Uh, I mean, it's an old chestnut here at the UN. It's been discussed for decades. There's no progress whatsoever because the permanent members in particular, I must say China and Russia and the US don't want progress. I think the Europeans are a bit more flexible about it. What can be done in the absence of expansion or changing the veto, perhaps removing the veto? Well, I think there are a couple of things that could be done that are actually practical and realistic. And one is, for instance, making sure that parties to the conflict to which particular conflict are be, that's being discussed should be invited to address the Security Council. R remarkably, that does not happen in most cases. The Security Council sits here in New York and talks about these places far away without actually inviting the people concerned to come and talk to them. And I, I think in the 21st century, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. The other idea that is, is I think, plausible, whether it's achievable is another matter, is limiting the use of the veto in cases of genocide or, or mass or war crimes, serious war crimes, which has been proposed by a number of member states here, that the veto should not be applied in these cases like Rwanda, uh, DRC, Syria, that the Council must act that no member state has the right to block action when serious atrocities have taken place. And I think that's a very legitimate argument. I must say very briefly, personally, I do not think expansion of the membership or giving other countries the veto is going to help. I've sat on the Security Council as a delegate for many years, and believe me, having more people in there is not going to make it agree more. Well, Remy, Pierre, your view, was there anything that you heard there that you would agree with, a way of constructive reform? Actually, there's, a, there's very interesting points that were raised right here. Uh, the idea of, of including more partners, maybe not members around the, the Security Council table, but having the parties present. Uh, when we look at, for example, negotiation for climate change, the fact that you have uh, the, the representative of the, of the uh, civic society, uh, the different NGOs that take parts to uh, maybe some, some talks that when there's actually a blockage, just show that there's, there's, there's issues that have been that has to be dealt with with, potentially leave the, con the, the conferences. This shows also uh, a, a movement, uh, 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 an expression of, of, of outside will. And maybe that's indeed a very good, uh, a very good way to move forward. Well, Russell Chabonet, uh, your view, is it possible to reform this institution, do you believe? Let's get that out of the way. Is it possible, do you think? Yes, indeed, it is possible because, after all, it's, uh, the charter is, is crystal clear and the charter has many uh, articles in it and, uh, and many clauses in it that talks about the, the institution to be very democratic and the, institu the institution to be flexible and democratic. And there are many, many ways uh, 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 you know, by the members to limit, for example, the veto power or to force the veto power to be explained to the General Assembly. For example, how about if we, uh, if any uh, country wants to use a veto, let that veto be first and foremost presented to the General Assembly and let the General Assembly also vote on it, let's say 75 to 25 or 50-50 or 60-40. Let the international community also participate in such a veto and understand why such a veto is legitimate and it is not uh, uh, basically ordained or exercised based on the national interest only of that state or only of that party. One of these reforms could be going back to the General Assembly. Another reform could be also ensuring that the General Assembly will be uh, or present on every single issue at the Security Council because the General Assembly is the more democratic institution or the most democratic institution at the United Nations. The Security Council does not represent the will of the people. The General Assembly does. So if we go back and we take most of those resolutions to the General Assembly and we require the General Assembly to vote on those issues, I think the General Assembly can reflect the will of the people, the, the will of the international community much more and better and stronger. Well, well you we're getting lots of uh, agreement from Khan Ross uh, there. Khan, uh, uh, that particular point about getting vetoes before the General Assembly, including the General Assembly, in the processes of the Security Council, do you think that's viable? Well, I certainly agree with the point that permanent members should be made to explain themselves if they use the veto and they should feel the pressure of international opinion and the views of other countries. I have to say I don't use the word democracy in the General Assembly in the same sentence. I mean, there's a great many non-democracies in the General Assembly and a, a, a group of countries voting a particular way doesn't, to me, constitute democracy. My view of democracy is you get the 
people concerned, the, the parties on the ground, the people affected, the victims in front of the Security Council, to, to, to tell them what they think the answer should be, really making that connection between the conflict on the ground and the machinations of, of diplomats here in New York. That is not happening. And I've seen personally that when you put diplomats really in front of a conflict, you take them to the conflict area, this surprisingly often causes agreement. It, it, you, they understand the passions, concerned, the complexities of the issue, rather than indulging in these kind of silly rhetorical games of he said, she said, blaming each other, as we've seen a bit in recent days on Ukraine. But what we are looking at here, if I may come to you, Remy P, on this particular issue, is that regardless of reforms, we had some interesting suggestions there that could be looked at. But in the end, it's an issue of national will. There is not going to be a resolution of conflict or dispute if there is not the national will to do it from those in conflict or in dispute. Do you think that is a key issue? Well, the, the international legal system is based on the nation states, it's the Treaty of Westphalia, and that's, that's, it's been several centuries that we actually operate this way. Obviously, uh, globalization, the evolution of the modern world has made that those frontiers sometimes don't make a lot of sense. Uh, some several states actually are a, a juxtaposition of different subnational entities. Uh, supranational entities also tend, tend, tend to occur. Uh, whether the nation state is the relevant body to still be making the law and the international law is something that, that, that indeed is, is, on, is on the table. Uh, the inclusion, as our, my colleague mentioned, of civil society, of other members around the table is something that is, has to be worked on. But even if we look at this issue, who should be representing Ukraine? Uh, according to uh, Putin today, uh, Yatsenyuk is not the let's say, legitimate representative of Ukraine. It's Dean Yanukovych. So what would be the person to talk on behalf of Ukraine on those, on those decisions? Well, uh, so that those are, this will still, you know, raise some issues. Well, a viable point, uh, Russell Chabonet, your, your particular view on that, if we're talking about discussions, we are talking at the base of who is actually going to be talking. I think everybody should be talking, and I uh, I, I want to disagree with uh, my friend from New York here, Ambassador uh, Khan. Why? Because I believe that, that when I said democratic, I didn't mean that nations that are dem democracies or non-democracies. What I meant is the process itself. Because when we allow 193 members to participate on voting on an issue or debating an issue, this is what I meant by democracy. I didn't mean by, for example, the Congo is on the uh, on the General Assembly as a member. Uh, non-democratic but uh, uh, practicing or basically participating as a democratic state. That's one. Two, I believe the issue when uh, Pierre says that who will represent Ukraine. This is, this is the essence of the argument. Why would Putin represent Ukraine if Ukraine is an independent country and if the Charter of the United Nations basically holds the, the, the sovereignty of the state wholly? Why would Putin speak on behalf or why would Putin be allowed to define what happened in Ukraine as a coup while it was literally a democratic transition or a democratic movement? The Ukrainian people wanted to be closer to Europe, not closer to Russia. So well, I let, think let me just let Remy Pierre, if I may, Russ, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me just let Remy Pierre in on that. I, I just want you to, to be more precise. I never said that Putin should talk, should talk on behalf of, of Ukraine. I'm not taking sides here. I'm just saying that the vision of Russia is that Yanukovych is still the legitimate representative of Ukraine. The vision from the West is that actually it's been destituted by the parliament. Uh, so here you already have no consensus of what is the, the, the legal legitimate voice for Ukraine. Uh, I'm not taking any position on what was right or was wrong. I'm just saying that doesn't solve the issue. Russ, on the issue of uh, consensus, clearly critical in this particular point. But Con Russ, I actually do want to uh, very briefly just take a uh, slightly different look there have been successes done by the UN, by the UN Security Council. We think of Sierra Leone, a massive success, a country that went through a civil war, had a democratic elections in 2012, and is now supplying peacekeepers to missions, UN and African Union missions. There is a possibility for good and for progress to come out of UN action, is there not? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And when the P5 are united, it can be a very powerful force for good. Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody would dispute that. The trouble is some of the most serious cases of war crimes, atrocities, genocide in the last two decades, the UN has failed to act. Um, you think of Rwanda, you think of Yugoslavia, you look at Syria today. DRC. DRC, the UN is acting, but not effectively. And I do think the great powers, the P5 and other countries need to take a rather more fundamental look at what 
security requires in the world today. Personally, I don't think this is about kind of sweeping views of international law, of who is legitimate to speak for whom, but rather about who is fighting and how do we stop them. The truth is most conflict today is not about states fighting each other. The Crimea is rather an unusual case, rather an unusual exception. The vast majority of conflicts are about militias, armed groups within states, terrorists, Trans global terrorist transboundary security phenomena and states talking to each other, the charter, the rules against states fighting each other are not actually terribly helpful in these cases. And I think we need to develop a rather more sophisticated approach to these kind of conflicts. Well, at that particular point, we come to an end of the discussion. My thanks to our guests, uh, Remy Pierre here in the studio and Khan Ross and Russen Chabonet in New York. And you can join in this discussion online. Follow these links for Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching. I'm Mike Hanna from me and all the team. Goodbye for now.